so here we are, waiting for a connecting flight to South Africa. I'm on my way to a supernatural ministry school in a small town called Clarence, along with 70 other students. We can see in scripture that God moving supernaturally was a normal occurrence for the early church. But does God still work through the supernatural today? Can it be part of a normal Christian life? began when a friend of mine asked if I could document a supernatural ministry school. So myself and brother in arms, Josh McQueen set out to record the events to unfold. Right is Gareth, the first local we met. He leads the church hosting the Supernatural Ministry School. Straight away, I noticed from way in which he spoke of his town, his neighbours. He clearly loved and valued everyone in his community. The visionary behind the school is UK-based Julian Adams, a like-minded friend of Gareth's. We asked Julian what made Clarence his venue of choice. God has begun to move in Clarence in an amazing way. It was planted um, a few years ago and it was birthed in a move of the Holy Spirit. Many, many people getting saved and added and we wanted to just come and bless what God's doing. We wanted to be a part of what God's doing. We're excited about taking 70 plus students, getting them jam-packed, full of God's Spirit, crammed with God's Word and then letting them loose on, on the township. Upon arriving in Clarence, we had some time to explore the local area in which we were staying. The area that Julian said is seeing amazing acts of the Father's love and power through the Spirit. I'm not going to lie though, there was a sense of relative normality in the air. I wasn't feeling an overwhelming sense of God's presence. Past the cultural differences, I felt very much the same as I would in England. In which case, if Julian is correct and there is something special about Clarence, it must be due to more than mere geography. The beauty of the way God works is that if somewhere has experienced revival before, it's like there's a doorway open and there's an invitation for God to do more. So we can press into that, press into the legacy of a place and invite God to come and do even more than he has already. And I think that's what we've been excited about, a place with revival history coming here again and saying, great, there's an open doorway, let's push in for more. Each morning, all the students gathered for a time of worship and teaching. We weren't just there to sing songs or to fill our heads with more knowledge. We were experiencing the love of the Father through seeking and meeting Him. This week is not just about getting a touch from heaven, although that is what will happen. It's not just about filling a file more notes because of a conference or good theology, although there'll be good theology. It's about equipping people to impact their sphere that God has given them with His love and with His kindness. And that's what we're after. One of the biggest revelations that we're seeing coming increasingly to people is the Father Heart of God. Yeah. An understanding of sonship and an understanding that we can do everything not from a place of working for, for God as a master, but lovingly serving our Father and working alongside Him as His children. To be overcome by your presence, Lord. Burn within my 
In the afternoons, we hit the streets of Clarence. We wanted to take the love of God that we are experiencing and practically demonstrate it to the local community. This looked like encouraging and praying for the local people and seeing them physically and emotionally healed. Yeah, I think the exciting thing as we hit the streets is that there's no miracles reserved for special people, yeah. but we all get to do this stuff. And I love the idea that I can pray for the deaf and they can get healed. I can pray for the dead and they can get raised. Not because I'm a special healer, but because God is my Father. He lives inside of me and so by His power I can do anything. And that goes for all of us. It's something that every child of God gets to walk into. We are Christians from uh, Dietlaben Church. Dietlaben Church, you know? For East Brother. Okay? Yeah. okay. And we pray to Jesus for healing. Yay! Yeah. Okay, we pray with you. Yeah. Ooh, right. Ooh, you're taking me, man. Okay. Ooh, you're taking me, man. You're taking me, man. Okay, we lay hands on you. Can we do this? Is that right? Okay. This is uh, Marco. Oh. Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Okay, Dave. Alright, nice to meet you this way. Is it the back or the head? It's a, a bit of both, I think. Can I put my hand Oh, nice! Elizabeth. Is it feeling better? It's good, it's sharp. <laughs> Ask her how I had it. How is your head? Very much. Perfect. There we are. What's just happened there, Marco? She just got a completely healed her from her back. And um, she had a heaviness on her head, uh -huh. on the head okay. and, and she, she could completely move her. And then we just amazing. Her back her completely, completely <laughs> healed. So that's she amazing. Healed. Praise God. Amen. We proceeded to meet and pray for locals all over the town, collecting many encouraging stories as we went. During the course of four days, over 100 people were healed. Not all of them could be caught on film, but one encounter in particular captured our attention. We were fortunate enough to stumble upon it with cameras at the ready. We followed some of the students into lot 961, where a lady who is over 100 years old lives. This lady had been completely blind for over 10 years. Can we ask, ask we confirm, yeah. The local church knew this lady, and had previously spent time with her, showing her the love of God. The local church then organised for a team of our students to go into her home and spend some time praying for healing. Camilla. 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 Can you come, guys? Sure. You guys go in and... Thank you God that you are the one who makes all things new. Yes. So we speak to these eyes and we say be completely well in Jesus name. Let these eyes see clearly in Jesus mighty name. Lord, we thank you Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Yes. Is there anything better? Is it better? 
We've just met this beautiful lady and her son who invited us into their home and uh, this lady's been blind for a long, long time and we just had the joy mm. <laughs> yes. mm. of just um, praying for her mm. Mm. and um, mm. bringing the love of Jesus to her yes. and um, she couldn't see anything yes. and suddenly she said she could see colours, she could see our faces yes. and um, yes. we're just overwhelmed mm. yes. <laughs> with God's kindness. <laughs> It's an incredible privilege, and um, yeah, we see the, the reality of, mm. of Jesus' love. Mm. It's such an amazing thing to see this, and a lady, uh, when we left, she said again, I'm so happy, I'm so happy, I'm so happy. Her son John uh, wanted to receive Jesus, so we prayed for him, and he's, he's a Christian now, he, he loves Jesus now. And thank you, Jesus, that you're in this house today. You are the healer. Yes. Thank you for that, Father. Yes. Pray that what John has seen today, Lord, touch his heart. In the evenings, all of the students and members of a local community gathered together to worship God. We wanted to lift his name high so that all around could hear. The second evening, as we were worshipping, all the power in the tent went out. My first response was one of fear. What are we going to do? How are we going to continue? But my fear was quickly met with the realisation that there was a tent of people who weren't concerned about whether the lights were on or off, whether they could hear the instruments or not. All that mattered was seeing Jesus lifted high in worship.
140 people gave their lives to Jesus. Many more were also healed, including people who were completely dead. Yes, This week I had the privilege of praying with a lady who's blind in the left eye. Um, she's been blind since 2001 when she had an accident. Um, could see absolutely nothing out of that eye and one of the evenings in the revival meeting I just felt God speak to me about this lady as I watched others praying for her and I felt him say actually to tell me to go and kiss her eye and so I took a step of faith and I went and I asked her if that would be okay and I just leant over it and as I kissed her eye I felt such compassion flood over me and started weeping over her and commanding life into that eye and as we prayed as a group um, she opened her eyes and she said for the first time in 13 years she could see light out of that eye and we kept praying and we're still trusting God to complete the miracle that he's already started in her but what really impacted me as we prayed for her wasn't going for a miracle but was feeling the love of God for her I just felt the love of God sweep over me and overwhelm me so that I was overcome with tears and as I prayed for her I was able just to keep speaking over her the father's words of love and affirmation and delight into her and what was amazing for me is that the next day she came and found me and just hugged me and thanked me and said to me that she just felt completely different felt so good and I could see physically that something had been lifted off her as we communicated to her the love of God. The thing about miracles is that the foundational element of them isn't seeing God work in spectacular ways to bring healing, but it's actually a transference of the heart of God towards that person. So that no matter what happens as we pray for people, we expect that we will see miracles. But above that, we expect that they will get an understanding of the love of yeah. God for them. The aim of praying for someone is not just to see fireworks, in terms of a miracle, but it's to bring the Father heart of God to that person so that they will walk away blessed knowing that there's a God in heaven who loves them and delights in them. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Speaking in tongues is not the point. Love is. It is neither angelic eloquence nor the mastery of human language that persuades. It doesn't matter how poetic, prophetic or profound I may sound. My conversation is reduced to the hollow noise of clanging brass cymbals if love's echo is absent. I could predict the future in detail and have a word of knowledge for everyone. I could possess amazing faith and prove it by moving mountains. It doesn't make me any more important than anyone else. Love is who you are. You are not defined by your gifts or deeds. Love is not about defending a point of view. Even if I'm prepared to give away everything I have and die a martyr's death, love does not have to prove itself by acts of supreme devotion or self-sacrifice. Love is large in being passionate about life and relentlessly patient in bearing the offences and injuries of others with kindness. Love is completely content and strives for nothing. Love has no desire to make others feel inferior and has no need to sing its own praises. Love is predictable and does not behave out of character. Love is not ambitious. Love is not spiteful and gets no mileage out of others' mistakes. Love sees no joy in injustice. Love's delight is in everything that truth celebrates. Love is a fortress where everyone feels protected rather than exposed. Love's persuasion is persistent. Love believes. Love never loses hope and always remains constant in contradiction. Love never loses its altitude. Prophecies will cease, tongues will pause. The quest for knowledge will be inappropriate when perfection is grasped. What we perceived in prophetic glimpses is now concluded in completeness. Burning my spirit, 
Burning me, yeah. 